So let me launch this legacy weekend by just asking you all, all this question. Who are you intentionally setting up for success? Like if you have children, right, that's probably the easy response. You're helping your children. You're setting them up to succeed. But let me push you a little further than your children. Who else? Are you setting up someone at work to succeed so much so that they might even get the promotion over you? Are you setting up teammates that maybe you're on a team with to succeed so much so that they might get the starting position over you? You know, I love the days of Pittsburgh Steelers training camp when guys like Aaron Smith and, and Brett Kiesel used to actually take rookies under their wing and help them and show them so much so that it might cost them their starting position or even their job. Amazing, right? Well, whether it be an employee, a teammate, or your children, helping others succeed requires this. You've got to give away a portion of your best. And that's what Jay Passavent, our founding pastor, and I would like to talk to you about today. And I want to set up a scripture that we're going to use in, in Numbers 27. It's, it's in your notes. I mean, it'll be up on the screens in a bit. And if you've got your Bibles, number, Numbers 27. But let me give you a little backstory before I get to it. This story is about Moses. And, and Moses, it's after the time he's led all the people out of Israel. He, he's wandered through the, the wilderness for 40 days. The promised land is just literally over the hill. And God takes him up to Mount Nebo and, and shows him the promised land and then informs him that he will not be leading the people into it. But Moses is instructed to gather the nation and transition his leadership and authority to someone else, to Joshua. In Numbers 27, 16, it, it says this, um, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in. They're talking about battle there. That the congregation of the Lord may not be as sheep that have no shepherd. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of, of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand on him. Make him stand before Eleazar the priest and all the congregation, and you shall commission him in their sight. You shall invest him in him with some of your authority that all the congregation of the people of Israel may obey. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest who shall, who shall inquire for him by the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At this the word shall go out and at this the word shall come in. Again, battle they're talking about there. Both he and all the people of Israel with him, the whole congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and made him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole congregation and he laid his hands on him and commissioned him as the Lord directed through Moses. And I just want to ask you like a question about this. Put yourself in Moses' shoes. What would your response have been? If you had led the people all these years to the promised land, to the edge of the promised land, and then found out, was informed by God that you, you were not going to be part of it, I think my response would have been like, seriously, God? Like, what? What? How about, can we co-lead? Can, can Joshua and I like co-lead in here? And I don't know, I'm just being like brutally honest. If I'd have found out that God had really made up his mind, I, I think God had checked out. I think, I was like, you, you, okay, you want Joshua, go get him. You train him. He's, he's, all, he's all yours now, right? Somehow, though, Moses understood the need for leadership succession, and he desired to set Joshua up to succeed. Hey, if you're newer to Northway here, um, you might not know some of this, that, that, that Pastor Jay Passivant launched Northway about 36 years ago with eight other couples. I came to Northway 15 plus years ago as the family ministry pastor, also did a couple years as the executive pastor here. Jay determined some time ago that it was time for a leadership transition succession, and after an external, sort of extensive internal and external search, it was announced in March of 2011 that I would become the lead pastor. In a church service up here in September of that year, Jay officially, the elders officially commissioned me into that role. And in the first few months of that, of that year, Jay and I led together as he was handing things off to me. And, and then sort of year two through, up through year five or so, um, Jay mentored and advised me. And then he had specific leadership, leadership responsibilities that he cared for. 
And now we've moved into what we would call sort of the final phase uh, of this, this transition. And Jay now moves into a role as advisor, as friend, as mentor, as member, as elder here at Northway. And I say this with all humility. That there are a massive number of churches across the nation that have failed miserably at transitioning from a founder, senior pastor to the next leadership. I, I talk to a lot of churches. There is wreckage and carnage in a lot of churches that, that have tried to do this. A, a successful transition from Jay to me has been my number one priority on my job description over the last five years. And much of that has taken place behind the scenes. I know that it is so important for this transition to be successful, not only for us to, to just sort of make it happen, but, but to actually be able to grow the church and to have, the, have the church thriving through it. And we've done that. And I think there's sort of four things that I see. Um, one, most importantly, God's grace, right? God's grace in, in something like this. Secondly, both Joe, Jay and I, we're committed to each other and to the, to the church. Um, third, again, behind the scenes, we have such a wise elder council board that led through this process. And then fourth is you. This is an amazing church. This is a strong church that insists on unity at its core. And because of those things, we have not only just went through a transition, we have grown through a transition. So back to my original question, how do you intentionally set someone up for success? Well, I think there's four quick points that I saw in that text that, 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 that I read to you. And the first one is this, the original leader must truly desire the other new leader to thrive. Moses said when he found out this new, that he, that he did not want his sheep without a shepherd, right? And he asked God for the best, and he desired him, Joshua, to succeed. If Moses would have, like, secretly wanted to remain the leader, right, all that would have resulted in would have been just years of manipulation and frustration, and it would have been awful for the nation of Israel. So I think in this area, you've got to ask yourself, when you want someone to succeed or bring somebody along, is that truly your heart's desire? Is that truly your heart's desire? The second thing is this, in verse 20, God told Moses, you invest in him some of your authority. Now I dug into that a bit, that word authority there, it, more accurately it means some of your splendor, some of your majesty, some of your best. God was asking Moses to give Joshua his very best. And if you're going to help someone succeed, you can't withhold your best. You must willingly give away your best of yourself. And just a side note on this, as I was talking uh, about that, has someone done that for you in your past? Has someone given you their best, taken you under their wing when they didn't need to, G given you insights and knowledge to, and an opportunity to move forward? If there is somebody, thank them. T take a moment sometime this week and thank them for doing that. The third thing here, it requires giving the new leader ownership before they are fully ready. Moses, in verse 22, he takes Joshua before all the people and he commissions them. Joshua wasn't ready for what was ahead. My goodness, the battles that he was going to face. But let me put it this way. No one was going to be ready for that moment. But Moses stepped up and, and, and did it. See, if you're waiting for someone to be fully ready before you give them some of your authority and set them up, nothing's going to happen. Because, frankly, they're just never going to be fully ready. And, and, and the first three of these points sort of were on the original leader. This fourth one, uh, it says this, it, it requires the new leader to take the reins and begin to lead decisively. Like here, just tell me, let, let, listen, you cannot pass on leadership or help someone succeed if the person you're trying to help doesn't want it. Right? If the person that you're trying to help doesn't want your help or doesn't really want what you're, what you're offering them, then I just want to put this bluntly, find someone else to invest in. Because the person has to want it. You know, who are you passing your influence on to right now? Who are you raising up by giving them some of your authority, some of your very best? Who are you setting up right now that they may go on and do greater things than you've ever done or could imagine. 
You know, over these past five years, Dr. J. Passavin has carried this out with unparalleled excellence. He has desired for me to succeed for the sake of, of this community that he loves and, and that he launched. He stepped out of authority and passed his best on to me. And even though I was not ready, he did not blink. And on my part, I've accepted the weight of this role and have attempted to lead strongly and decisively for my love of this church. And you know, at times, Jay and I, we, we've danced really well together. And, and sometimes, right, we, we've stepped on each other's toes. But th there is no one other than Jay and no one other than this church that, that I would have rather spent these next five years, last five years with and looking forward to what's next than the Northway Christian community. So, so before we hear from our founding pastor, Dr. Jay Passavin, um, we decided to put something together just to, to, to bless Jay. Um, some other sort of local Pittsburgh pastor giants um, we got together. And I just, I didn't say this last night, I wanna say this. We reached out to some, some names and, and folks that you're gonna recognize if you've been around Pittsburgh. And you know that each one of them said, yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'd like to, I'd like to, to speak about Jay. They were, they were all um, in. So, so take a look at this. Pastor Jay will transition up. And North, I would expect that we would honor Jay when he steps up to this, to this moment. I'll, just, I'll leave that up to you, though, okay? So take a look at this. Well, hello, Jay. This is your old friend, John Guest. And it's, a great, it's great for me to be a part of this uh, honoring of you and saying thank you to the Lord for all that he's done through you your willingness to break away from the old traditional scene back in the early days. I remember those days with you. And to leave behind the traditional church, not the teaching, not the theology necessarily, or the, the, the history of the gospel, but to be able to break out and in those very early days before there were all these mega churches and uh, large non-denominational churches, you led the way and God has blessed you. It's hard to plant a church. It's harder still to lead that church through numerous changes in changing times. But the greatest challenge of all is to transition your leadership to another. You have done all three successfully, and I want to join others in congratulating you in the name of the Lord. Congratulations, Jay, on your transition. Thank you for all that you've done for the North Hills, all you've done for the churches in the North Hills, specifically all you've done for me. When I started pastoring here in Cranberry, Clueless was an understatement. You came alongside us and you helped us. You invested in my life. Today, our church reflects that. And so thank you for everything. And the legacy you left behind doesn't just stop at Northway. It, it, it goes so much further. And so just pray that you have a fantastic next phase and next steps of your life. We love you and God bless you. When I think of your legacy, I think of a legacy of both courage and generosity. Uh, the way that you uh, handed the reins over to Pastor Scott, I think one thing that really sticks out to me about leadership is that the greatest leaders can be seen in what happens when they're not there. And when I look at what Pastor Scott and the direction of Northway to be such a healthy growing congregation, it's a, a tremendous legacy that you've left. The kind of mentoring that you've given to so many, including me, has gone on to reach countless people, far beyond what any of us could even imagine. There are so many things that your life is an example of, and I look at the ministry there, uh, the, the wonderful way that you've impacted the body of Christ, and of course, my life and the people in our church. And so I want you to be encouraged to know that these are your best days. There's so much that God's given you that you need to give to others. And, and I'm trusting that we and our sons can also be a part of that in some way. So we speak blessing to you and to the hand of the Lord upon you as you continue in your march to do what God's called you to do. Thank you so much and for your friendship and for your love. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you. It, uh, I just saw that video uh, montage for the first time just before the service last night, and um, it's just very humbling. Those, those are five terrific men, and just to be in the same conversation with them is a blessing. And it's something that one doesn't set out to do. It's just a consequence of what happens. And um, I want to say, number one, uh, those men all know me, and they know my weaknesses as well as my strengths, and the fact that they were still willing to do that was a blessing. Um, but your appreciation, your expression is so valuable to me. Um, you're my church family. This is still where I call, this is my church home. And by the way, uh, Scott mentioned about the difficulty of this. I think it's about 5% of the 30% that succeed at the first try. Only 5% keep the founding pastor around. They usually bless him with something and say, here's part of the blessing, the other part's on the other side of the country. Um, and I'm serious, that, that's been one of the remarkable things that I, I've enjoyed, and I want to thank Scott and the elders and all of you for just, just continuing to love me and give me the opportunity to be here. And um, I want to say also, I, I wouldn't have made it this long or close to it without uh, my life's partner, and she's here, and I want Carol to come up real quickly and just thank her for... Obviously, this phase has not been as hard on her as it has on me. Um, but uh, <laughs> well, I love you. And, oh, do we have a picture? Oh, yeah, that's, we, that's sort of the fruit. There was just two of us when we started that. Uh, <laughs> so you wonder how, <laughs> how the world got populated. There's just a good picture of it. So thanks, babe. All right, thanks for your, thanks for your prayers and your love. And, um, yeah, one other thing, just uh, so many things I want to cover and just simply can't in short time, but all of that applause, all of those uh, expressions, I thank you for them, but I want you to know that I know the glory goes to God. Amen? That's where the glory goes. And I, I don't mean that just sort of, you know, perfunctory. No, I, I know in my heart, if God had not been in this, it would not have happened. We couldn't have sustained it. So I'm going to be just, just real transparent with you and, and, and practical right now. And try to answer Pastor Scott's first question is, are you setting someone up to succeed? Uh, I'm going to get to the how we're doing that and how I've been doing that. Um, because fundamental to that is an environment of unity. Unity is the, is, the, is the place where God does great things and the church multiplies and the kingdom grows, the, the presence of God's kingdom. Um, and I gotta say right out of the gate, it has not gotten easier over the last years to maintain unity. I have just, I can't tell you um, how glad I am that I had the wisdom of getting this off my shoulders uh, at the right time. Um, and by the way, uh, Moses and, and Aaron are not exactly a perfect match. I, um, you know, the next thing that Moses did was to die. I, I haven't been given that note, but uh, unless, <laughs> unless you know something, Scott. No, okay. okay. But... Uh, Some device had its 10th anniversary last month that has really changed a lot of what goes on in organizations. You know what it was, right? It was the iPhone. iPhone turned 10 last August. And this can be a very helpful instrument in expressing interest, encouragement, edification, and it also can be a WMD. 
you can get something on this that you can't really respond to. It's not correct, it's not well informed. And um, I just want to urge you to be very careful how you use this device with one another and particularly with your pastoral team and your elder team. Um, this is one of the things that's made it really hard. Everybody's got a voice now, even if they're not even part of the church, and they can make something happen. With that. And the second thing is our commitment to being a multi-site church, which was part of the vision that I, I was passing on. We'd already started the Oakland campus. That's been a wonderful way to reach communities that we otherwise would not be able to draw from. The Beaver Valley campus, which is about to start, I am particularly excited about because that's where I grew up, and I know there's a great opportunity there, and I'm excited to see where the Lord takes all that. But, but all those things stretch unity. They make it more and more difficult. So just a few minutes, I, I want to focus in on what I think the secret of doing this is, and then you have to live it out where you are. Um, let me ask a question to begin. What was Jesus' gospel? We all talk about the gospel, right? We believe in the gospel, the good news. What was Jesus' gospel? Well, read Matthew 4, and you'll see that as he came out of the desert where he had the temptation by the evil one, the Bible says he started his ministry, and his message was, his gospel was, repent for the kingdom of heaven, or kingdom of God, is here. The message says it this way, change your lives. God's kingdom is here. And so Jesus spoke it, but then here's the thing that made it all different. He then demonstrated what that meant. That's why he went from town to town and place to place where he, he listened to people. Almost every time that I can tell, he met their felt needs first. If they needed a touch, a healing, a deliverance. If he needed provision or if they needed uh, wisdom, the Lord just, he demonstrated what it meant to have the kingdom of heaven now on earth. By the way, there's a, one prayer that almost all of you pray, you would know, that says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Friends, that isn't something simply in the future. Jesus brought that into the now. That's what we should be seeing in the now. And where we should be seeing it is right amongst us, right here. That's why I know we still have work to do. I still have work to do. But that's the message of Jesus. That's our message as well. And from the very beginning, when Carol and I first met with the other eight couples who founded Northway, the best way we knew to describe this was to call this just a community. The name church being left off of our name was intentional. We didn't forget. We wanted people to know we were about relationships that helped people discover what it meant to know Jesus to be in relationship with, not religion, but in relationship with Jesus. And those eight men made, and their wives made that commitment to us. You know, Pastor Scott mentioned one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult challenge in his life has been working in this position. And um, he, he was really right about that in many, many ways. Uh, I got a couple broken toes. Um, and so does he. But I'm so glad to be here today and to say, but we go on together. For me, the, just to, real quickly, because it has to do with unity also, when Carol and I were wrestling with what to do, at age 33, I had three kids, age one, three, and five, and I left a very stable and, you know, well-recognized denomination. I left my salary and my benefits. And I looked into the eyes of those eight couples. I didn't know where my next paycheck was to come from. We didn't have a place to go, no roof, 
no place to meet. So here, watch, we started as home groups or small groups. We started with four small groups and met for six weeks in that way. That's why in our DNA as a church, small groups have never been a program. They've been how we see ministry best happening. And so all that was scary, but it was most scary when my dad came to my house one evening, which he never did, just sort of casually drive by. And uh, he had the most intense father-son conversation I remember in my whole life. He said, you just can't go doing something. You've got a wife and three kids now. How in the world? And, and he went on for quite a while. And I, I said, Dad, I don't know how to tell you any other way, except I know this is something I must do. He said, well, all right then. I'll support you. I'll be there for you. And he was here for the remaining years of his life. Um, about another 18 years, he was here. He would come and bring my mom over and they, but that moment, friends, that, you know, when it's your dad and he's looking at you saying, you're really messed up. And, and, but I'll support you anyhow. But see, it was the power of unity amongst the elders group, or at that time they weren't elders, we just called them the servants council. That was their unity, our confidence. And here's what happened as a result. I never missed a paycheck. I mean, it went down some. It had to. I mean, it had eight couples. It went down some, but I never missed one. Our health care got reinstated fairly quickly after all that. The Lord provided a place for us to meet. And on and on we go. So the unity of those eight, nine couples, including us, that formed the confidence for us to believe God for what he wanted to do here in the North Hills area. And I got to say, uh, one comment that Brother John Guest made was, he was right. We were the first folks to do what we're doing. There's a lot of churches now. You go up in Cranberry now, there's, uh, what, 15 or 20 churches that have started over the last years. But when we did this, we were the first one. And it was quite a journey. The thing that we were called most often by the world outside wasn't Northway Christian Community. It was that cult of Pastor Jay. <laughs> and it, it took some just faithful demonstration of the love of God for people to finally get it. So what does this mean to you? And, and I'm going to add to Scott's. Uh, he made four great points out of that text. I'm just going to share with you three. And I didn't put this on the outline, for, so forgive me for that. Uh, but he graciously left room where you can just jot these down. There's three things, three ways that you can intentionally set someone up for success, all right? The first one, first thing that has to happen is you have to be right with God. Or number one, you have to make the move to become and grow as a disciple of Jesus. You have to make that move. People have on innumerable occasions said to me, you know, when it comes to all this, you know, experience of God and, and hearing his voice and prayer and, and the spiritual gifts, if God wants me to have any of that stuff, I'm open and he'll give it to me. And they put themselves in what I call sort of a passive position that they're not going to really do anything unless God just, you know, shows up on their front porch someday and says, okay, it's you. And I respectfully want to just submit to you, that's, that's not what I see. That's not what I believe, another way of saying it. There's a little lockbox on your heart, loved one, that not even God will force his way through. You have to turn the key at some point and say, Lord, I need you now. I surrender to you now. And then that begins, then he takes over, and I've said this hundreds of times to people, you make one simple decision, and then he brings the full resources of heaven to bear in your life. And you, st you start to grow and change in ways you can't imagine. But you've got to take the first move. The biggest obstacle to that, by the way, it's busyness. You're too tired to really look into it or commit to anything. 
uh, you're too overloaded, you don't want to, you want to stay home and don't be bothered, you're too stretched. You know what you do? Then you start drifting. And then you drift away from where you thought you would be. So, number one, move to be a disciple or be, and by the way, that isn't something you do one time. It was Jesus who said in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness every Sunday morning. No. Seek is in the Greek tense that implies continuous action. Every day. I wake up every day just like you. I get out of bed one leg at a time get dressed, and I say, Lord, this is your day. And then I go and I try to fellowship with God. That's how I begin my days. And sometimes I succeed, others I But got to do it. Number two, you got to meet other disciples. You, meet, you need to meet other people that are also in this journey. And, oh, boy, I, I wish I had more time to ex- just share with you the enthusiasm and appreciation I have for what Northway as a church makes available to you. Next week, if you haven't already heard the announcement, or you will, there's, there's going to be a, a fabulous event. And, and Mary Mercer and her team here at the Wexford campus, make time, just go and talk and, and, and see which, if any of those things, would be a, a point for you to connect. And there's always these, you know, our, our fundamental building block, which is our home group or small group that meets in homes. Northway is, I mean, an unparalleled resource for all of you. And and by the way, that's a specific answer to Scott's question. How am I going to make someone succeed? Well, you know, when you walk into this room, then you can easily walk out and never really get to meet or know anybody. It's possible to do that. But when you're in a home group or small group, a regular group that meets at a regular time, it's not long before you get to know them and they get to know you. And it's not long before one or two particular people become really close and you then begin to do what we've been encouraged to do. You start to do what you can to help them succeed. It's such a joyful service. It is not a burden. One of the great moments of my being in this season is that people stop me and just say, I want to thank you for pouring into my life. And sometimes I don't even remember their name. But my heart's blessed by what they say and, what, and the change that God's brought to pass in their lives. Um, right now, and I have no time to go into the details of this, I'm spending quite a bit of time with Roman Catholic men and women. Because you know what I found? They've been pulled into this thing, this web of religion and all these practices, but they've never really had a relationship with Jesus. How many of you know somebody or related to someone who's Catholic? There might be three hands that didn't go up there. You moved here from like probably Utah or something. Uh, (laughs) May I paint the picture this way? When you begin to connect with others, when you meet other disciples, they broaden your life and you broaden theirs. And it's an incredibly powerful thing. And the third thing, third simple way to fulfill that that challenge is, first one is what? Move, take a step, you got to move in. Second then is meet, and implied there is meet and get committed with another group of disciples. And the last one is commit yourself to being used by the Lord to make new disciples. And if you look up there, I I put the, the sort of general theme that that comes under in in our language in the church. It's, well, the first is worship, making the Lord first. The second is fellowship. That's what we do with one another. And this one is making new disciples 
outside of the church, and that's evangelism. You know, I think the fear that most of us have is that we're going to share with somebody or we're going to step up and they don't care about what we believe. Have you ever had someone tell you, well, that's fine for you, you know, believe whatever you want, that's not for me. And here's what I've found and just learned from my mistakes and experience. The reason is, is that they think you want them to somehow be convinced that your religion is right. Never see evangelism or reaching out to others as, you know, pushing them up into something, making them do something. No, see it as you, watch, pulling them up out of the fog of the world that we live in today. Because when they start to see what they've never seen before about life in the kingdom, the way it's supposed to be lived, they're going to want it, friends. They're going to want it. They're going to say, I never understood that. But I want, I, I need it. I want that in my life. And it's a radical change. It's the best way I know to start the process of helping someone. Let me say it another way. If you become best buddies with folks and you just hang out with them and you golf with them or you, you know, talk about, and you do all this, but you never talk to them about Jesus, you never talk about a relationship with God through his son, then you have not done the most important thing that you could do to help them become a disciple. You know, if each of us would just do those three things and focus on moving toward the Lord, meeting with other disciples, and then in one way or another, either spontaneously or intentionally, making new disciples. By the way, I think it happens more often than not by just listening to what the Holy Spirit's saying to you and then you doing it. You do those three things, you're going to be too busy to pick up your WMD device and say why you think the ushers need to do a better job. <laughs> that was the ushers. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? No, it will be a time that you will make a positive difference and you'll be too, too blessed to waste your time criticizing and finding fault. And all this is only possible because of what Jesus gave to us. And here's how I want to conclude. He gave us, the Bible says, his great and precious promises. The promises of God are simply... What God says we'll experience in the kingdom of heaven. And when did the kingdom of heaven come? One person. Right. When Jesus said he did. When he said repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So it's here. So the promises that we hold on to, those are God's sort of Blank check, a blessing for your life so that you might be a blessing to others. Now, how did Jesus convey this most important situ uh, uh, circumstance? Well, two special ways in the gospel. This is it. John, by the way, is the only gospel where communion, as we understand it, is not explained. But what other action did Jesus participate in in John that is explained? The washing of the feet, the posture of a servant, where Jesus says, hey, what you've seen me do for others, you do as well, for the servant is not above the master. And then he closed that time, by the way, with the disciples, and here's a text up on the screen, just jot it down. This is from uh, John 17, John 17, verse 21. My prayer is not for them alone, that was 12, but I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. So that goes all the way to today, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I'm in you. I'd love to talk to you for an hour about fellowship in the Trinity. What does it mean to have fellowship in the Trinity of God? Next. So may be one, so the world may what? Say it with me. Believe that you sent me. So one of the byproducts of serving and loving each other 
is that the world notices. And God says, that's how I get their attention. The other three gospels though, Jesus does something which I think is even more intimate, and that is he tells them prophetically that he's going to end his life. I think Pastor Scott mentioned that if you want to see another life change, you have to give up something. And it is absolutely the case. But what a blessing to know that the one that we call our Savior, our God, our Lord, and our spiritual lover gave up his life on a cross for us. That's where it starts.